This week's streaming audio sees the return of one of our favourite guests, Anna MacDonald, with her annual roundup of the year's most noteworthy Apache Kafka bugs. She's got scary ones, surprising ones, and a few enlightening corner cases, things that make you think, ah, that's how that works under the hood, that kind of thing. Along the way, we're going to learn some interesting details about how batching works, how the replication protocol actually works, how Kafka's networking stack interacts with Linux's one, and which, in her opinion, is the most important Scala class to read, if you're only going to read one of them. What can I tell you? Those of you who know Anna will know she's a force of nature. This is my first time talking to her properly, and all I can tell you is hold on tight because she drives like a New Yorker. So, this podcast is brought to you by Confluent Developer. More about that at the end. But for now, I'm your host, Chris Jenkins. This is Streaming Audio. Let's get into it. Joining me on Streaming Audio today, the infamous Anna McDonald. Hey, Anna. How you doing? I'm doing excellent. I would like to, again say that I'm shocked every time I'm allowed back on this show. <laughs> and so I'm well, excited. Since last time we switched hosts, so I have no real idea what I'm running myself in for. Yes, I may never, yeah, right? Never, after this, it'll finally be. This be like, could be the last no. one. Let's make the yeah. most of it. You have the honor, I checked, you have the honor of being the most frequent guest, probably because of your repeated annual series of Screaming Audio Halloween specials. Yes, I think I, I did that on per. That's how I, yeah, volume, right? What do they say? <laughs> quantity over quality? Yeah, I mean, never mind the quality, quality feel puns. the fitness. Yeah, quality puns. And yeah, yep. no, I, I do. I, I, uh, I enjoy podcasts because you can kind of listen to them while you're doing something else. So I've always kind of mm. been a fan of the medium. Ah, oh, excellent. So we were going to try and get you in for this Halloween and life got in the way. So yes. you're back here for what I think we'll call the Jira Nightmare Before Christmas. Episode. That's right. The Nightmare Before Jira, which, as you had <laughs> said, it's always kind of a nightmare. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, is it <laughs> Sorry, Jira people. The, yeah, but... whoever, yeah. I mean, they're nice people. They are. But still, it's paperwork. Um, yes. Nightmare Before <laughs> Christmas. And hold on. I just I don't know if you can see this or not. I was supposed to be making something else, but I made a Apache Kafka Christmas tree. Oh, for those who um, are just listening to this on audio, Anna has a Kafka logo made out of, is it holly and baubles? Yes. And I took, like, I chopped up with, like, these awesome planner shears I have, like, this, like, fake greenery. And then nice. I stuck the Christmas little things together, you know, the, your Christmas bulbs or whatever they are, on the end of them with a glue gun. And then I made the Apache Kafka logo. I was supposed to be doing something else. It was not as interesting and fun as that. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know that kind of feeling. All the good stuff happens while you're supposed to be doing something else, right? Absolutely. Mm. You got to make your own fun. But you do work hard. Let's not get off the topic here. You you work hard finding some very obscure bugs with Kafka and fixing them, right? I do. Well, sometimes they find me. <laughs> <laughs> they know where to usually, look. Usually, yeah, that's usually. And, and so I've got some really good ones um, for us to chat about. Mm. Um, one of them, my note was, you know, this is it took up a lot of your life. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't really have to take a lot of notes about that one. But some of them um, are, are very fun to dive into. Uh, and I'm excited. Let's do it. Yeah, I have a preview list. One of them is actually related to something that's been on my mind a lot lately, which is producer batching and um, sticky partition assignment. Yes. So let's yes. start there. Tell us the bug. So what ended up happening is if you you have the sticky partitioner and and it had the best intentions, right? It wouldn't it didn't set out to sabotage people. But what ends up happening in a producer just to level set is you have this this thing called batch size that you can set. There's a default. You have this thing called linger MS. Those are your two weapons in terms to kind of optimize your throughput, right? Yeah. Linger MS, as the name might sound, I love it because every time you just think of that cranberry song, <laughs> it's not just me. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. I sing that and I don't care on like Zeus because <laughs> it's my, you know, I need to entertain myself. Um, but it's really like, <laughs> how long should I wait in order to make sure this batch is full? Because yeah. in some situations, maybe it never gets full. Like if you have spotty traffic, right? And you don't want to wait forever. So you send it. 
So what ends up happening is for a sticky partitioner, let's say that you want your data to go as fast as it's coming in. Let's say you have like a huge fire host topic. It's fantastic. Tons of data all the time. Set linger MS to zero. Go, 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 go. Right? But no. (laughs) (laughs) So what they ended up finding, and this is something that was readily apparent on, you know, I I ran into this more than once on Hmm. customer calls is, all of a sudden throughput would like dot like drop. It would be, it'd be horrible all of a sudden. And you, we, when looking at this inside of the producer guts, as I like to say, you would notice there's this thing, it's called the record accumulator. Shockingly enough, it accumulates records, right? <laughs> and that's your producer batching, as you said, right? Cause like we try to batch up, right? We, in Kafka, we don't really, you know, it, you can use it obviously, and people do use it for like single message, but really it's made to produce batches. You know, records are yeah. stored in a record batch, right? They're evaluated, they're compressed. Like it's it's a batching kind of thing, right? I and mean, it's got when a timestamp for when it started for yeah. the sake of lingering, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, so we, um, so when you look at this, it was fascinating, right? You would see like some partitions, it had accumulated like two records and like other partitions, it accumulated like 37,000. <laughs> And you're like, wait, what now? (laughs) Like, what's going on here? And what ends up happening is the original implementation of the sticky partitioner, if there was a slow partition, and there are many things that can make a partition slow, most of the time it's something going on on the node, right? So if there was a slow partition, that would give that partition a ton more time to accumulate records. Because if you're using especially X equal all, it's going over. While that partition, right, let's say that you have in max and flight set to one, right? While that partition, while you're waiting for that request to come back, that the producer is accumulating records for the next send. So it takes forever for it to come back and say, yeah, I sent that batch. Then you're just going to sit there being like, and more and more. Filling up this buffer. Exactly. Absolutely. It's like, like what I would say is like, you know how like you, somebody's making you dinner, but you're super hungry. So like you start eating a box of crackers, right? (laughs) And like the longer dinner takes, like the more Tris gets your munching on. You're like, yeah, okay. You said 15 minutes, but it's been 30 and I'm starving, right? Like a small (laughs) child. Um, So that's kind of how this works, right? The longer it takes, the more crackers you're like popping it. Um, Yeah, and you get absolutely full before uh, it's even got a chance to ship out the next meal. Absolutely. And you know, to the point where in some cases, it's almost unrecoverable depending on that slowness, right? Right. Like, and and I think, so So this is, by the way, we should have said, and this is normally how we start, this is Kafka Jira 10888. We are going to have links. I'm going to update a document with them. We'll put them in the show notes. Yes, so people can see that. But it is in in case, again, if you're just listening to this, you might even be driving. Don't stop and look. That's not safe. That's bad. Don't do that. (laughs) But, you know, later while you're, you know, on your laptop sitting on your bespoke couch, um, that yep. was for Dennis, who keeps telling me the def D- Whitakin, who's been on the show, um, yep. keeps telling me the definition of bespoke and says I use it improperly. Um, I think it's a fun word. So <laughs> okay. he said he said it means like I he said it means there's only one of them in the world and it's made by hand because I said I would give someone a bespoke beer and he was like, are you going to brew it yourself? And I was like, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I, maybe I am. I thought bespoke meant like custom made that's what i thought yeah like yeah but i mean there there could there could be two of them that were you know Mm. right yeah if you do a small batch of beer especially for that person that's That's what i'm saying and i brought my friend you know chris matta who's awesome he also works for us i bought all his brewing equipment and brought it up to my farm so i could so suck it dennis (laughs) that's right okay we we have derailed slightly from the jira bug to uh throw shade on dennis and that's okay i love dennis to death also I want to, um, I want to, when when we're talking about, so, so the sticky partitioner to get Mm. back to it. Right. Yeah. Um, so what do we do about this? So there's, there's another person that works for us. His name's Artem. He's awesome. He is one of the best dancers I've ever seen. I asked him if I was allowed to share that on this call (laughs) or on this podcast. He said, yes. So, um, so I'm allowed to share it. And what ended up happening is Kip 794 came out of this. Right. And if you haven't read KIP 794, it's great. And it talks about how we can have, it's called the uniform sticky partitioner. 
right? Ooh. It's almost like, you know, except for like me who likes VI better, like VI and like Vim, <laughs> right? Like I don't use yeah. Vim though because, you know, I just feel like it's too easy. Um, you <laughs> How know, do you feel like, about Ed? It, well, it, yeah. Uh, well, it's not bad. I mean, what about said, <laughs> right? Like it's like, yeah, yeah exactly. So okay. I don't, um, but, but it's like, you know, it's like Vim, right? Because it's yeah. better. Uh, and it's great. And the kip is wonderful. So one of my favorite things to do is to read. I always read kips. If you want to understand Kafka internals, reading uh, Kafka improvement proposals, that's what kip stands for, is one of the best ways to do it. People okay. spend a lot of time and effort um, putting details in there. They're updated based on feedback from the dev mailing list. I strongly recommend that everybody read kips. And this kip is no expect exception. So um, this was all taken to an, into account in the kip. And now we have the uniform sticky partitioner, which does not have this problem. How does it work? How does it solve the problem? So I am going to, in many ways, there's there's a couple different mechanisms. Let me um, find the best way to say this because it is a, it is a very, um, so it's basically, I mean, I'm thinking of a good analogy for this. Hmm. Um, so instead of saying, hey, right, every time we create a batch, we're going to switch partitions. It's every time this batch size got produced to the partition, right? And there's a really good, now I'm just going to, you know, read this, right? So if you're producing to partition one using the default batch size of 16K, right? Yeah. B, KB. Um, if that got produced to partition one, we switch to partition, let's say 42, and also nice use of the 42. When I turned 42, I was the answer to everything. It was amazing. <laughs> I had been waiting so many years to say that. So I'd assumed you're in your late 20s, so um, I have no huge, opinion on that. Oh, no, I'm 43, man. I'm old. That's why I'm like allowed to use these things. And to anyone who's older than me, don't be offended. I'm jealous. I wish, I mean, I can't. <laughs> Angela Lansbury, and I should say this, like saddest day mm. of my, she's my hero, has been my hero since I was a kid. And when your hero is a, you know, elderly yeah. lady solving mysteries on a bicycle you really like grow up wanting to be old because like you know i'm like man i don't not that not there yet but you know i'll get yeah. there so yeah, you know embrace your hopefully. oldness it's awesome man <laughs> okay um so anyway back to this so after you know they produce 16 kb to partition 42 you go to partition three and so on right you just kind of do it r regardless mm. and this is the idea with uniform, right? The distribution is uniform of the records. Because if you look at the original issue with the sticky partitioner, yeah. the batching was incredibly non-uniform if you had a slow node or a slow partition is, is better to say. I'm Look, spoiler alert. I'm getting into our next one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I know, right? It's foreshadowing. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, so if you have, if, if you have okay. a slow note, it was like, you know, batch size, batch size, batch size, right? Like, oh, I went outside the frame, batch size, batch, batch size, right? Um, yep. And so this is an attempt to keep those batches uniform. And and again, I you know, we could talk about just this kip on the entire episode. So hang on. Yep. But now I misunderstood something here because I thought the whole point of a sticky partitioner was that you stuck to the same partitions by and large. So how come you can move partitions? So no, that so no, there so there used to be like round robin, right? The sticky yeah. partitioner is basically when like and and again, like it would be good to read that kip too, the original sticky partitioner. Um mm. if you look, yeah, okay, I just want to make sure I can find the kip number. So kip, that's kip 480, right? 480. Um yes, kip 480. So basically we used to have this thing and it was called like round robin fashion. So we just kind of would go produce this one, this one, this one. This is when there's no key, right? Yeah. The sticky partition kind of sticks to a partition until a batch is full. It's the idea of instead of just going, you know, boo, 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 boo. Let me think about a good analogy for this. It's the idea of, I know what it is. So let's say that you're at like one of them things that people do where you have to make a cookie tray. What do they call it? Cookie swaps. I'm sorry. I love I love Christmas. You ever been to that? Where everybody like brings cookies and you're I not can, supposed to. I mean, to I can imagine it, but I don't think it's a thing we have over here in England. Oh my gosh. You should just do it every day. It's great. Right. You just, so you bring <laughs> cookies, right? And you right. make up like plates of cookies. So it's the idea of saying, okay, I have to make up eight plates of cookies, right? Right. 
I can eat and I have this big basket, these big, huge like tray of cookies I made. Yeah. Is it better for me? Like, let's say I know that I need to put eight cookies on, you know, all of my trays, right? Is it mm. better to say one tray, one for you, 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 and again, one for you? Or is it better yeah. to stand there and go, here's eight cookies, here's eight cookies, here's eight cookies, here's eight cookies? Which yeah. one's faster? It's the batching, right? It's the one where we're trying, we're trying to make sure that when we produce, we produce full batches to everyone. That's kind of yeah. why they call it sticky. But you're right that it doesn't sound, it sounds like, hey, I'm going to stick to these partitions and tell you what to do. But it really, it's about trying to equalize batching, right? It's sticky partition, right? right. Um, but you're, you're 100% right. Um, what you m also may be thinking of too a little bit, which is very close, same name is static partitioning. So static <sighs> Yeah, I am. I am. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right. but sticky sounds like you're sticking. Like, why? You know, there we could we maybe we should like yeah. fix. You know, the names are very so static partitioning, right? That's 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 kind of more perhaps what what yeah. we're talking. Okay. Yeah. And so, so yeah. In in your ex original example, then, if you've got like two messages in one batch and thirty seven thousand in mm -hmm. another batch, yeah. what's going to happen post this fix? Oh, so the thirty seven thousand would not be accumulated. It would get to 20 and then move to the next batch. The Correct. Next like, right. So when we accumulate right. the right batch size, then we hop. We don't just say, wait till you get the batch size and go, then go. So because all those partitions are accumulating records kind of in the background. So, yeah. and again, like we could, I mean, maybe we should, maybe, you know, you should get Artem on here awesome. and Justine okay. to discuss this. Both Artem and Justine, like the, Justine wrote the original, you know, kit for Sticky Partitioner. Artem, again, great dancer. Um, and he did, oh, and I'm in a, such a bad egg. He did a Kafka summit talk about this too, which I'll put in the show notes and goes over the whole thing, but you should have him on. I don't know if, okay. I don't know if Artem's ever been on the show, but he's fantastic. Um, so, so he should come on and I don't think he'll dance though, but if you get a chance. <laughs> it won't really work on radio, but we'll, we'll no, figure something that's out. That's true. That's true. Cool. Um, so yeah. And, and I think, okay. you know, yeah. So, so, so the idea, I think takeaway is right like the, the original sticky partitioner did not maintain a uniform distribution for batches when you have a slow partition for whatever reason um that can really get you in a cycle you're never going to get out of because of the backlog of records when you because yeah. yeah you know yeah okay so what hey hey anna yeah. what kind of things can lead to a slow partition on a slow node yay <laughs> Yay. And again, right? Like I did so much foreshadowing. Sin cookies. Because I was just talking about cookies. Sin oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, so as a, over here on the TCP stack, we call them sin biscuits, but it's the same idea. That's okay. Yeah, exactly. That's fine. I love that. Are they, yeah. and you could, maybe there's like a sin biscotti somewhere oh, nice. as I, well. I think somewhere around Rome in the Vatican, a sin yeah, biscotti Yeah, they're is like something dunking it in their coffee yeah. in smaller and smaller pieces. Yeah. Okay, so here's it. This is Kafka nine six four eight. Um, nine six four eight. Yeah, yep. nine six four eight. And the, I, I picked this one because this is the actual um, fix for this issue. But this is kind of the condition that caused me to realize and and kind of understand and spend so much of my life on the sticky partitioner, right? Yeah. Um, and basically, here's what happens. This, and this is also why I like this. So what you find in Kafka, and I think you find this in any distributed system, probably in most systems. I personally, though, think that in a distributed system, probably just because they're more tricky, um, this just shows up so much more prevalently, prevalently, is that certain types of configurations and use cases will be the ones that hit things where other people will be absolutely fine. And that's just computers. But man, does it show up in a distributed system. Yeah. So this one in particular has to do with the number of connections. So, you know, in Linux, Linux is amazing, lovely, friendly, mm. right? Tries to be fair about things. Yeah, yeah. And so when in Kafka, then, you know, in socket server.scala, right? We have this thing and there's a backlog, right? A backlog queue. And it's kind of like, hey, I'm accepting connections, right? I can't yeah. accept at the same time everything that's getting sent to me. So if I'm if I'm busy for a sec, put it in the backlog queue, right? Yeah. As one might imagine, that backlog queue has a size, right? The default size that we had, I believe, was 50. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
ha, Q length. So the Q length is 50, right? And so the question comes up and it says, okay, if I'm running my Linux distribution, Kafka's running on a Linux node yeah. and I roll my cluster, which by the way, should be an everyday occurrence. If you're afraid to roll your cluster, it's not the position you want to be in. You should not be operating Kafka or you should make some changes to make sure that you feel good operating Kafka. Um, right. okay. It's a huge red flag for me. Anytime I, you know, one of the things I ask people a lot of times is when was the last time you rolled your cluster? Right. And are you saying because it's a good thing to like, you know, the old problem with Windows, you rebooted the servers every week or they crash after a fortnight. No. Are we saying that or are we just saying you should no. be so confident in the recovery mm -hmm. abilities? Absolutely. Kafka is a distributed system. It's by default durable. And if you're afraid to roll your system and you because of outages, you're not configured properly. Right. That is kind of a huge red flag for issues. Like every time I roll my cluster, my customers have an outage. What's your RF? Right. It better right. be, you know, it is your your replication factor, right? Ah, yeah. Is it one, <laughs> right? Like, you know what I mean? There's all these yeah, things yeah. that pop up when people are afraid to roll a cluster. And so, you know, rolling your cluster, your customers shouldn't notice, right? Yeah. They should be like, yeah, whatever. I mean, you know, outside of some SLA things, which, yes, they're working on it. And hopefully with craft, it gets better. I mean, oh, leader yeah, and yeah. ISR time for metadata refresh takes a while but that's neat okay. and a while is subject that's neither here nor there I, that's another podcast that's another podcast yes but, okay. okay so you're saying that regular chaos engineering monkey thing well, i mean plus like you know the world that we live in a lot of times you've got to do patching of your os right it's mandated in regulatory yeah. environment so you better be comfortable rolling it right I, picking yeah. up new kafka updates right all kinds of all kinds of good reasons to roll your cluster that are not the restart your windows machine right <laughs> Yeah. Good reasons to roll it. Um, okay. Yeah. So here so we should, are with yeah. the Linux kernel. We've just done a rolling restart. Right. And so when that happens and we move back to preferred leadership, so, you know, leader election occurs, we go, you know, first of all, right, leader is going to change, right, to a non-preferred. When we take down this node, all the leaders on that node will boom. Mm -hmm. Then when we bring it at, back up, we move back to preferred leadership, right? Yeah. What ends up happening is all the producers that were producing to that node that had leadership, right? Whether it's going forward or back, whether it's moving back to preferred or it's going away from preferred. Yeah. All of a sudden they change and they start producing, right? Now, normally if they're doing a, and it's, this is why I say too, it's a very, it's, it's, it's a very, um, bespoke situation not bes like again see haha -ha, dennis um it's a it can it's a very um let me say it it's a it's a situation that people will find themselves in if they have a lot of clients is the way to say that right yeah um when there's a metadata update clients will many times they'll reestablish their connection um there are there are there are always exceptions to this like if you're using your own logic yada 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 but by default usually it forces a connection reestablished right yeah. if all of a sudden you have a crap ton of clients establishing a new connection to a to a linux server right yeah. and you're using the defaults in cookie settings and you only have a backlog of 50 in your yeah. back channel what ends up happening is linux is like hello i am the <laughs> arbitrator of fairness so I'm going to engage sin cookies, right? right? And so so when that happens, and this is if TCP sin cookie equal one, two, by the way, which I think, you know, most people have this set. There's there's not a lot of people who say, hey, I'm going to set my sin cookies to zero and just reject any new requests. Most of the time, people want this type of auto scaling. Um, they don't want it to kick in, right, like in this scenario. But there's for those uh, of yeah. us who haven't delved into the TCP stack recently, remind me what sing cookies do. So they do. So basically, what they're doing is they're acting as almost like a throttle. So they're making sure a server doesn't get overwhelmed when it has a burst of network connections. Right? You can think of them as DDoS protection. Right? Right. They're like, don't try. To, yeah, I don't think so. Right? Not today, people. So that's what they're doing. <laughs> they're they're a scale. And so there's this parameter, an external parameter, it's called W scale. And it's kind of windowing, right? Yeah. So W scale is your friend when it comes to batching. <laughs> it lets you it lets you send a lot more bytes per TCP package. As soon as the sin cookie mechanism gets triggered, right? Yeah. That goes away usually. Usually W scale, it's like, no, mm-mm. 
So all of a sudden, because it wants to be fair to all the network connections that are bursting on. Okay. Right? And it's also a way because there's, you know, when you're, if you're trying to DDoS some, you don't want to let somebody send you a crap ton of bytes, right? Like that's not what you're 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 about, right? And right. so basically, and this is kind of the worst part, right? Once you W scale goes away and you don't have that, that persists until the connection's closed. Oh God, really? Yes. So you're never going to recover. So if I'm a producer and like, again, yeah. let's take us back to the previous one we talked about. And I'm like, hey, I have this original, the OG sticky partitioner <laughs> and I am producing and they're rolling a cluster and all of a sudden Sin Cookie just kicked in <laughs> this cluster and W scale is gone. And now all of a sudden I have a slow partition that will never speed up. Right. So let me check. I've got this right. So you're mm -hmm. saying like new leader election. Ordinarily, that Linux box would let you send larger packets than usual. And that's great for throughput. But you hit over those that 50 connection window trying to connect to Kafka, which is a natural consequence of there being a new leader in town. Mm -hmm. And Linux not only says, whoa, back off a second, but it also says we're not going to let you enable that um, we're not going to let you have large window sizes at all until you reconnect. Yep. Ooh, ouch. Oh, yes. And the best part is, so if anybody ever wonders, everybody, if anyone's sitting here listening to this and going, is that happening to me? Just run D message. <laughs> it's like D all message. over there. It Yeah, you could see it. It'll say sin cookies, sin cookies, sin cookies. <laughs> and it's the holiday season. So don't get mad at it. Just eat a cookie and then fix it. So. Yes. The reason why, again, right, the reason why I picked this one and not the the flurry of mystery problems um, that or mystery Jira is actually if you wanted to see the first one that discovered this, it was Kafka 9211. I'll put that in there to the original problem ticket is because cool. how do we fix this? Well, we allow you to extend your backlog, right? That backlog size for the acceptor socket, making that configurable is really the like, you know, rubber stamp for this because what ends up happening is it allows you to continue to have a protective mechanism, which you do want because it isn't only like, and I'm not thinking of like, you know, people like with mustaches who are like, ha ha ha, you know, like I'm going <laughs> to angrily, but like a poor and misbehaving client can do awesome. You know what I mean? Like there are ways yeah. you can configure a client that could take your friggin' node down. So you do want sin cookies there to protect against people, you know, deciding to like, aha, or not caring, so to speak. Yeah. But you don't want that to impact good clients, right? So this is like my favorite type of fix, where we're allowing and enabling the correct behavior, but we're not losing the original protection. So you can yeah. bump this way up from 100. And one thing I will say is trying to remember what backlog size. Um, so, so you need to, when you increase the backlog size, think i'm not even going to say it because i have to look it up again there's a safe number that you can you can increase it to without messing with any of the other tcp stuff if you go over that number you will hose your node so <laughs> be careful when you increase this to make sure that you're following recommended settings for the other things that need to go along with increasing this backlog size and i should have looked that up and i did not i was probably okay. eating cookies instead Send us send us some uh, notes and we'll stick those in the show notes. Yes, I that? I have to. Well, see, but the thing is, is it it really comes down to what your individual Linux, you know, customization is, you know. Yeah. So you know, I, I want to say off the top of my head, you could bump it to one hundred. I think that's probably. But other than that, anything else, make sure you're looking into what your configuration is and adjusting those other parameters in order to account for it. Right. Yep. So. Just to recap that then, if someone's seeing on their cluster that some partitions, some nodes are getting really slow, especially during new leader elections, mm -hmm. then they're going to check D message and they're going to yep. see all this whole tray of sin cookies. Oh, yeah. And then with they're going frosting. to adjust with frosting, <laughs> with evil, evil frosting. Which parameter are we going to look at next? What's so it called? Again, too, this is only fixed in 3.2.0, in AK 3.2.0. Okay. So another reason to upgrade and be comfortable with cluster rules, Roll right? If cluster. you don't want to upgrade your cluster, don't operate Kafka. We have a <laughs> whole cloud service and a team of experts. Just let us run it. Like that's the, you know, do it, do it well or don't do it at all. Right. <laughs> that's kind of, you know, can you tell that's I a very like, fair, if slightly aggressive pitch. I was, for I'm cloud. from Western New York. That. That's oh, kind yeah. of our, I think that's our motto fair, but slightly aggressive. <laughs>
I think go Bills, right? Um, I think that is kind of kind of who we are as a people. Okay, yeah, right. I'm, I'm also nice, that. but slightly aggressive, right? <laughs> yeah. I think you should combine that: nice, fair, and slightly aggressive. Welcome to Western New York. We're going to get you that T-shirt made for next Kafka. Summer. That would be amazing. It would be bespoke, yeah. Dennis. It would be. It would be bespoke. He's going to kill me. I'm going to love it. <laughs> he really is. He, uh, so, so, so that's kind of, you know, and again, right, I think it's important that we did these two in order because it's kind of yeah. like, well, what could cause a slow partition and how long could it last? It's like, well, yeah. rolling your cluster and forever until you restart. So yeah, that's nasty. Yeah. And, and that's kind of, you know, um, that's why I like to do these uh, podcasts too, is because there could be somebody out there sitting around going like, why is this happening to me? And maybe, yeah. you know, here's something to look at. And even if it's not this problem, something to look at is your batching, right? Like check your check your produce for throughput, your timing, check D message. Always yeah. check D message if you have a problem on your notes. Like I am I'm consistently surprised. Now Grafana, Prometheus, very important metrics. Your OS yeah. is also very important. Like yes. Yeah, you know, like check it, run that stat, figure it out, right? Like I I yeah. think, you know, having and that's the thing, operating distributed systems is not easy. Operating Kafka is not easy. You also need to know about your OS and need to, you know, understand this type of stuff on a server level, right? People yeah, have to yeah, connect to Kafka in order for it to work, right? So Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. All right. Nice. But you still haven't told me, before we move on, you oh. haven't told me the name of that parameter. Oh, the backlog? It's just backlog. Yeah, well, it's TCP it's just backlog. max. Yeah, T TCP max sin backlog. Okay, cool. I think. Thank you. Is it? Right. Yes. <clears throat> That's the second parameter for bind. Yes. So the next one I thought we'd talk about, we've talked a little, we've foreshadowed um, leader election and part, um, yes. leader election protocols. Tell me something about that that goes wrong. Okay. So this is, this is Kafka 12686. And yeah. this is, so this one is very, 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 very deep internals of Kafka. It's also in my favorite class, which is partitioned at Scala. Which I love. Oh, it's my favorite. It is my favorite class. In Why is it your Kafka. favorite class? Because it does so much. <gasps> like if you want to understand the way that Kafka works specifically for resiliency and like anything about partitions, shockingly enough, go look in partition at Scala. Right? <laughs> partitions are what make Kafka work. It's what's consumed from, what what's produced from, what falls in and out. And that class is just a wonderful wealth of understanding about Kafka. Ooh, okay. And sometimes things go wrong. Right. <laughs> Um, it's partition at Scala has featured prominently in many of these, I think, previous to this. It's not the first time I've ever said that on the show. Okay. Um, I like to bring it back. That and purgatory. I love purgatory. I love purgatory. We're getting to purgatory. Yes, we are. Yes, foreshadowing again. So this yeah. one, we're going to talk about it at well, a high level. We've talked about sin, right? So we have to talk about purgatory. That's right. See? Mm. Look at this. Mm. How Halloween is this? Or Nightmare Before Christmas. Or Nightmare Jira. Before Christmas. That's right. Um so, so this one, I call this attack of the overloaded cluster. Because, attack of the overloading and cluster. And that may be, like that. you know, I mean, is that judgmental? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> because the only time we see this is really a race condition, right? And the only time we would see this problem was on clusters that had, I would say, north of 200,000 partitions for sure. Right? Okay. And that, the reason being, because believe it or not, when you roll a cluster like that, that has that many partitions, Right. Especially because like, you know, I mean, and I'm talking about a 25 node cluster either, by the way, I'm talking about a cluster that maybe has like, you know, seven nodes at most, maybe, right. maybe, right? Eight nodes, maybe okay. yeah. at most. So there is a ton of leaders that are sitting on every node. So when we roll these nodes, right, the number of leader and ISR changes are enormous. So when, yeah. when you, when you look at a race condition, right, hitting it, it's usually a little more likely. The, you yeah. know, how wide your field is. So that's kind of what go this goes in. And what happens is, and this is, this is, this is a very, like I said, again, this is a really, really deep kind of kip. So what happens is anytime you want to look at ISR. So ISR, by the way, is in sync replicas, right? Yeah. So when you're defining Kafka topic or Kafka, yeah, Kafka topic, you say, I want this many partitions. I want the RF replication factor on this topic to be this, right? Yeah. And so three what, being very standard, right? Yes. Three being very standard. Absolutely. Okay. Two being an abomination. One <laughs> being right out. <laughs> okay. Don't do that. Right. Shades of the holy hand grenade of Antioch. Yeah. See, yeah. exactly. Yeah. What was it? Was that, well, that was Monty Python, right? That was Monty Python. Yeah. You may Grail. call me Tim. Is that right? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look at me. What's up? My dad loves that. Oh, uh, yeah. He's a huge fan. Do you fan. know why he's called Tim? I re- learned this recently. No. It's because I think it's John Cleese. He forgot the line. The character had a much longer name and he forgot the name. And so he just went, uh, Tim. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's amazing. And that's what, yeah. Anyway, right. So three is- I really is, like that. It's better yeah. than Bert. Like Tim Bert, is funnier yeah. than Bert. I like that it too. Is, inherently. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we can say that now the old host has gone from this podcast. What? Well, yeah. Tim is, yeah, that's right. Where's, yeah. Hi, Tim, by the way. How are you doing? <laughs> Look at me. We're surviving without you. This has been going very well. We're having fun. That's we are. <laughs> No, Tim. Tim's amazing. Yeah, and and it was it was. I mean, for first of all, he let me do this. Now it's kind of a thing, so I think people can't really. You know, it's like you know, it's a tradition. <laughs> you know, but he was the first person who allowed me to do this, and he although he made it very clear in the first one. I don't know if you've ever heard it. He's like, mm-hmm. just to be clear, this was all Anna's idea. Oh, <laughs> and I know he said that because he was on the fence as to how it was going to go. So. This one is technically named race condition in alter ISR response handling. So when we look at ISR, that in sync replica, we got an RF of three, let's say, right? We've got a leader and then we've got two replicas, right? Those replicas job is to become leader should something happen to Mm -hmm. the original person. They're like, uh, what's his name over there? Prince Tim. No, the the guy in England over with you. You know, like if something happens to the queen, right? He steps up and is like, hey, I'm Charles. Right? Yeah, we have we have a redundant array of monarchists. You do. You have a yeah, redundant yeah. array. Exactly. See, yeah, there you yeah. go. Right. Yeah. And so there used to be the rule because you wouldn't like this because the number is two. But there used to be the rule that you would um, give birth to an heir and a spare. Oh, I've heard this. See, I watch yeah. a lot of English television. So oh. I. Yep. Yep. Not not mostly mysteries where people are killed in small villages and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. I do. That's how I understand cricket. I think we talked about this because I got yeah. so mad with all the cricket episodes where someone's killed with a cricket bat. And I'm like, I don't understand what they're talking about. So I watched a whole documentary <laughs> on cricket. And now I'm like, oh, yeah, I see that. Right. Okay, so so I, I got improving now. on monarchists. We have a replication factor. Right. You do. Three. Yes. We are and sending all the information to the other two. Correct. And much like the monarchy, because like, She's been dead for a while. He's still not been crowned king officially, has he? Uh, no, Does he, he have hasn't. to have a court? Do you see what I'm saying? So this yeah. is actually kind of perfect. This kind of happens. <laughs> and it says it's a pretty rare scenario. By the way, what's up, David Arthur? How you doing? Because David wrote this. And I and I like David Arthur. He's a cool, cool egg, cool beans. Um, but he said this is a pretty rare scenario. And it involves alter ISR, the response being delayed for some time. Much right. like the coronation of that guy, Charles, right? And what ends up happening is there's this, you can think of, of kind of an, of alter ISR, like having a state, right? So when it does, there is this, this kind of thing where there's an in-flight state and because, and this is a, this is kind of a great way to think about anything that's async, right? Right. You've got to be very, very clear on state. Right. And have good state machines and good kind of coverage for this kind of stuff if things are asynchronous in your system. Right. Kafka is very asynchronous. I love it that way. Synchronous Mm. things are annoying and brittle and I do not enjoy them. I don't want to have to wait. (laughs) Right. Like I like that thing where you call and they're like, if you want to call back, just push, you know, yeah, call me back. Right. Like, why do I have to sit on the phone? Same thing with this. Right. I'm not going to sit here. I'm going to send you something. Eventually it'll come back. And so. The bug in this is there is a alter ISR manager that is in charge of altering ISR. It takes things in, it takes them out, right? Changes that ISR set, the in-sync replica set. And the problem is it's not checking to see if there's anything in the in-flight state. Like it doesn't go look and it doesn't say, hey, do I have stuff in flight? It doesn't do that before it clears away pending items. Right. Which is, so, which is yeah, which is not on. good. I feel like you ought to explain what we do, why we have an alter in sync replica message. Well, so let's say that a node dies. Yeah. That replica sitting over there on the dead node is no longer in sync. It's dead. So we have a different list of in sync replicas. Correct. Now. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And there's some settings you can tune on that too. You can say, okay, this is how long I want to wait. You know, this is what my, this is what I consider in sync basically. Yeah. Right. Some people said it to be more or less, depending on your tolerance. Right. Um, so 
when we look at a partition, right? The issue that you end up with is the state doesn't match what we're expecting to find in unsent items. So basically it says, hey, I'm in flight. There's something going on with me. There's an in-flight change to my ISR. I'm a partition. Like, you know, like, ooh, what's going on? I don't know. Like, we should wait and find out. Yeah. But when that happens, there should be something pending because you're in flight. There's something in flight, right? There should be something, a corresponding thing in pending. Yeah. And when when we call partition, this is kind of why I said, again, it's the number of these that happen because as soon as you increase the number two, it's more likely that there might be a delay because yeah, it's doing yeah. so much at once. So for example, that cluster role, when we're calling make leader and that's in there, it's partition make leader, right? It basically says, okay, um, get rid of this and no pending items, right? But the in-flight state was still there. So basically what happens is there was still something outstanding going on. And somebody came in and just said, eh, and clobbered it. Now, any time, and this is kind of, this is also why I brought up the async system thing. Any time, and, and this is, we, we do a lot of protection in Kafka. A lot of it has to do with epochs, right? Like we'll look at an epoch and we'll say, okay, mm, you have been out to lunch for a long time. And what you're <laughs> trying to deal with, the leader you're trying to deal with is from four epochs ago. Refresh your metadata and carry on with your life, right? You don't get right. to make any decisions. You're old. And there's a similar kind of blocking concept that happens here, right? Yeah. So what we do is basically kind of block. We say, hey, now this in-flight partition response has come back, but whoa, there's been things that have happened. Right. Since this thing, because we've cleared stuff, we've done. Right. So even if that delayed response finally comes back. It's like. No, things have changed, so get rid of anything for this partition and the way this looks like in real life, and I've seen it in multiple real life scenarios is. You run, you like restart your cluster, right? Yeah. Nothing ever moves back to your preferred leadership mm. ever. Because your ISR is basically locked. Every single ISR request you're ever going to send once yeah. while this leadership is owned is batted to the ground. Because it's like, no, something's still in flight. I don't know. It's my state. My state's still in flight. Even though there's no pending items. So anything you send after that, it's like, no, no. And so that ISR, I like to call it frozen in time. So right. if you ever find anything where your ISR looks like it's frozen in time, this could be what's going on. Right. Okay. And so, and I, like I said, this is very, very, like trying to, and this is why I, I, I'm going to read more about this. I, I love to have like real life analogies to describe everything. Mm. This one is kind of like, it is a decoupling of the state machine. It breaks, right? Yeah. yeah. The state that I'm holding doesn't match what I expect to see, Right. And so the fix for this, the workaround, I should say for this, by the way, this has been fixed. Um, it was fixed in 3.0. Um, the, but the workaround for this is to force leader election. So once you force leader election on this, you move leadership away from the node that has this kind of state, right? Yeah. All this stuff is cleared out. Your ISR, uh, your ISR um, state is reset and you're good to go, Right. Could it happen again when you try and move it back Absolutely. again? Absolutely. Not back again, oh, but fine. it could happen again the next time you roll your cluster if you don't get the fix for this. Oh, right. Okay. Yes. Yes. But, but, I, and, and this is the, the other thing too is I have never like, I, this is definitely due to scale. This race condition gets triggered by people who are doing a crap ton of leader and ISR changes per node. Right. right. Yeah. And I think, you know, that has to do with the nature of a delayed response. Um, and also, I don't know how to feel about this. David, that you said this is a pretty rare scenario, and I've I've seen it multiple times. I think it's just me. <laughs> you know? The but queen kudos, of kudos rare for scenarios. getting on it. Yeah, and fixing it. Yeah. Uh, um but but if you haven't like done and, and read if if there's any if there's one class that you're gonna read um ever partition. In AK, it's partition.scala. Okay, okay. I I I'm going to confess my biases here. I try to avoid reading Scala if I can. But for you. But it's, it's Java Scala, though. 
Uh, I mean, I think I think many people Java. would. I don't think I'm going to offend anybody by saying it's Java Scala. Java Scala. Okay. Yeah, but that's a classic thing. That's a classic pattern, isn't it? Like um, the combination of a state machine which assumes a series, mm -hmm. an exact series of trans transitions and asynchronicity. Yep. Screwing that yep. up. Yeah, yeah, yep. absolutely. All Did right. You... Okay, so that takes us to... Oh, now this this one stuck in my mind because the um, ticket number is 12964 which is how you can start dialing my mother. <gasps> That's awesome. Yeah. Don't you yeah, love fact. it when that happens? Yeah, it's like, <gasps> is that spooky or are there just lots of integers in our lives? I know, right? I don't know, yeah. but I like it when that happens. It makes me happy. Whenever mm. I see, I'm like, hey. But this gives us an opportunity to learn something about segments. Yeah, yeah. So so if you were to go look on a an, any Apache Kafka node, right? You would go look yeah. at the file system. You would see log segments. That's how we store data, right? I mean, I know, like, I think some people are like, that, that's not what, but it is. Kafka is a durable log. That's all it is. Mm. Um, you know, as much as, you know, perhaps, I don't know how to say this in a way that isn't. Some people like to 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 have a different spin on that. But technically, at its heart, Kafka is a durable log. Sorry, that's what it is, right? Yeah. And so um, when you go look at it, there are log segments. And so this is uh, the, the title of this one. I call the killer from the past strikes when you least expect it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's Kafka 12964. 12964. Um, and the actual title of it is Corrupt Segment Recovery Can Delete New Producer State Snapshots. That sounds scary. It's by the time you've got corrupt and delete in there, I'm already worried. So here's the thing, right? Again, like, I don't know what this says about me, but what in Kafka, and this is this, if you go to to re, like reboot a node, right? Shut down a node. Yeah. There is a time amount of time which, if you exceed it, and that's configurable, the amount of time, right? Mm. If you exceed it, it will just shut the node down. We call that an unclean shutdown. Yeah. When Kafka comes back up, it assumes that the segment files are corrupt, and it goes yeah. through and does this type of a type of a, a thing. Which is another thing to look at if you see really long startup times, right? In your when you roll your cluster for a node, like go yeah. go see if you're getting a clean shutdown. Um, one of the things which which I think would be great to have would be a kind of you know a property, an additional property that's a flag that says, hey, if you can't do a clean shutdown, don't shut down at all. Yeah. Okay. Right. That we don't have that. We just have but an amount of time. Down. For some reason, it for for that reason, it comes back up and it assumes the files are corrupt and it's going to what try and fix them, resync them from yeah. other nodes. Yeah. So it, so it looks and it's like, hey, like what do I need to do here? Do I need to truncate the log? Like what am I looking at? It runs through all this code, right? And that's in log Scala too, just Ooh. in case you would like to know, right? Um, and when we do this, there's like because think about it, this node could have been down for a very long time. And so we're also doing cleanup, right? So we're like, hey, right, let's look at like, do, you know, do some cleanup, figure this out. Um, and because it, it, again, it's replaying from the leader. It's figuring this kind of stuff out from the current leader for the partition segment, right? So so this this is kind of the scenario we're in. So maybe that node was down for, I don't know, long enough where we also have some segment files we can delete because they're no longer valid, right? Um, they've right. been, yep, they've rolled off due to the amount of time or settings or whatever it is. And so it doesn't hurt anything for us to schedule that delete asynchronously. Again, I love yeah. asynchronously, right? Like, I mean, it's awesome. It's like whistle while you work, right? Like I'm over here doing my <laughs> yeah. work and like, this is just going to delete asynchronously, right? When things are quiet, you can get rid of those. So I'm going to read this verbatim. Okay. So we, we make sure to do this, we, just, we we cover this for log, again, for our log segment files by renaming. We basically said, hey, if there's anything we're going to delete asynchronously, rename those to have a log dot deleted file suffix. Okay. Right? And the reason for this is because if we truncate the log, the actual, this is why we did it for the, you know, for the segment files, it may result in deletions for segments with matching base offsets to segments which will be written in the future. And, and the reason for that is you could, oh. yes. So there is a, there's a, there's a case where the base offset 
for a log segment file if we didn't rename it. In the future, and this is again, you have to think in an async world, right? Where yeah. anything can happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So this is also before we had anything like topic IDs or anything like that, right? Yeah. So you could rename, you could delete, rename a topic, right? Recreate it from start, right? Let's say that the async stuff hadn't run yet. Who knows what could happen? Because deletes happen async. Like there's all kinds of things that can happen, right? Yeah, yeah. And so just to be safe, we say, okay, while we're running this, we know that this is what we want to delete. So we're going to rename it and have a suffix. And this is for log segment files. Unfortunately, we were not doing that for producer state snapshots. So producer state snapshots would have, and this, again, it says, um, it leaves us vulnerable to a race condition. We could end up deleting snapshot files for segments written after log recovery. And producer state snapshots, the reason we take those, and I love this, is because of people who are esteemed like Kafka Streams. And so Kafka Streams mm -hmm. aggressively deletes stuff and truncates stuff like when it doesn't need it anymore. Like after you do a repartition topic, we used to actually say, okay, well, producer state is based on the last time this producer ID like produced to this topic. But if you're aggressively deleting out of that source topic, it invalidates producer state super fast. Yeah. And so instead of that, we're like, okay, no, 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 that doesn't work, right? Instead of that, we use these snapshot files. So we take a snapshot, right? That's an example where we do this for transactional producers, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of what this is saying. It's like, hey, take a snapshot, right? Make sure that this is more durable and long-lived than the actual topic because there's reasons for aggressively kind of deleting. And just like, and if you think about this, just like a log segment, right, could suffer from asynchronous delete where other things have happened and now you've got something kind of named the same. So, yep. so, so also could a producer state. So we weren't doing that. And I'm kind of betting, I mean, and this is a little disappointing. This never, I never saw this, which is, you know, sometimes it's like seeing, you know, a, a dodo bird in the wild or like, I think those are all gone. Um, what are those called? The, the, uh, oh, like a pellated woodpecker in the wild. Cause those are really cool. They're really cute. Okay. Like woody woodpecker. That's what they look like, but real life. They're crazy. Um, yeah. You just kind of want to see one. Like you don't want it destroying your house, but you're kind of like, kind of be neat to see that. And I haven't seen this one. <laughs> right. I'm not happy either I way. Either I see too much. Or I don't. Yeah. But I think this is really cool. And I'm just glad anything that helps us like, so EOS and Kafka streams is passion of mine. A lot of people use it. It bundles a transactional producer and a read committed consumer inside of it. So yep. anything that hardens transactions is pretty important to me. So I was really glad that we found this. Um, okay. So let me make sure I've understood this. Mm -hmm. You're you're going through, you're recovering the file. You say, I'm re doing recovery. Oh, those files can be deleted at any time. So you take a note of those and delete them asynchronously. Yep. Then I come along and I resync a file, which happens to be the same file. It's we not the, the same, same file, file, but like the base offsets, right? Base the same offset. base offset. Yeah, yeah the same the thing base that identifies offset. that file. And there are things that can happen to reset, you know, like you could reset, you could do all kinds of, there are reasons why another file with the same base offset could exist and that one would not want to be deleted. Yeah. And so I've marked it for deletion. I've write, written a new one and then the deletion happens and it right. takes out my new one. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Exactly. You. You. Exactly. Yeah. And we cover for that in log segments. We just didn't cover for it in producer state snapshots. And that was right. resolved in 3.02. So that Three, made me happy. 3.02 or 3.0 as 3 .0 well. 3.0 as well. 3.00 right. as, well. okay. as well. Thank you for clarifying that. Just to be sure. Just to be sure. This is an aside, but my one of my favorite albums of all time is called Soft Music to Do Nothing To. And the musician just released a sequel, annoyingly called Soft Music to Do Nothing 2. And that's really not helpful to anyone. Oh, I wish it was 2-2. Two, two. Oh, no, he went, just went with... I mean, I'm never going to get Alexa to play it. So. Or 2 squared. Yeah. But... That would be cool. He should put anyway. math in there. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was an aside we didn't need. But it's Did a great he do album, it on purpose, you... like a pun? I think so. I That's think awesome. So. I mean, I like yeah. that. That's kind of a devious mind. Like, good luck getting anything to play this. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of want to now design know, unplayable but... album titles. This is amazing. <laughs> if you come up with an unplayable album title, I'll write the unlistenable album to go with oh, it. Oh, that'd be great because I am yeah. not musical. 
in any <laughs> sense of the word. So that would be awesome. All right. Depending so the on, last one. Yeah. So the last one, sin, purgatory. This is a really dark note to end the podcast on. Yes, it is. And it's also kind of like, it's kind of like my favorite thing in the entire world. And Jeff Kim found this. And when he did, I slacked him immediately. And I was like, what, son? How did we not do this? Like, I mean, you don't ever get that thing where you're like, ooh. And here's what happened. That was me. I was delighted. I was delighted because I was like, boom, I'm putting that on the podcast. So this okay. is. I love Airing this. your dirty laundry. Yeah. Well, I mean, AK, it's open source. That's the best part about open source, right? Is there, there's no dirty laundry to air. It's everybody's laundry in a mass pile, right? You <laughs> okay. see it. It reeks of this. Yeah, yeah. And also, it's just being transparent, right? Like, I, I, and it's nobody's fault because the other thing I love about open source is there's a natural prioritization that occurs. And the mm-hmm. initial design and the initial intent of this feature right? There's a reason why I believe that this didn't come up. So that's kind of also interesting to see is that in open source, right? Squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? Okay, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so so I don't find this embarrassing at all for anybody. It's just really like, oh, it's one of those. I did. I'm going to giggle about it again. So it's Kafka 14334. And I call it, whoops, I forgot to buy you a gift by Christmas. Um, <laughs> okay. Because what it is, is in 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 fetching, right? Like when you're a consumer, we want to be good stewards. And I always say this, right? Everything in Kafka is a request. There's a consumer fetch request, producer, you know, fetch request, replica fetches. Everything's a request. And that is, if you can't make requests, if your request pool is saturated, then Kafka doesn't work. Right. Mm. And there are things that you can do on the consumer side to be a good steward, to make sure that when you're fetching, it's worth it. Right. It's almost like setting constraints. One of them is, you know, like min bytes. So that means, you know what? Don't keep giving me these piddly fetch requests from a consumer. Don't actually send the data back to me until you have like at least a meg, right? Yeah. Make and then it you worth could get time. like really annoyed about it. You could like look at, you know, your 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 fetch and be like, like that. That's like what yeah. I would do is like, please, what is this? This is nothing. I need more data, right? Yeah. So that's another one. And people do this um, often to be good stewards of their infrastructure and also because for the process, for like whatever processing they're doing, they want it to be worth it. Like there's a lot of reasons why you might want to set min fetch bytes, right? Yeah. I've Um, seen recently like just for catching up on consumer lag, that makes a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, like it's, you know, for throughput too, right? Like let's batch it up. Let's not like death by a thousand paper cuts. We don't like that. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. So that works great. When you're fetching from a leader and what happens is you say, hello, I have a criteria for my fetch. And when that criteria is not met, I must go somewhere to wait. And where does one wait? Purgatory. In purgatory. Yes. It's the definition of it. It's my favorite thing in the world. By the way, Lucas Bradstreet, they better not change the name of purgatory. <laughs> okay, you're serious. You're really I am serious. serious. I'm that. watching yeah. you. I'm watching you. This is okay. live, not live, but it's taped, but it will be on the air. So okay. I love it's purgatory. Indelible. It's immutable. It is. That's right. Oh. Um, so when you're fetching from a leader, it works great. So I have a I have a criteria for my fetch request. I go and I go sit in purgatory and I just wait, right? When that criteria is met, I'm popped out of purgatory and the data goes back. Yeah. All is well and good for leaders. We never did that for followers. So follower uh-huh. fetch was introduced, right? Yeah. It was introduced as a way to kind of, there, there are a couple of reasons why it was introduced, I believe, right? Um, if you look, it's really had to do more with location, right? It had to do with spanning multiple data centers, right? Um, and we wanted to make sure you could kind of have your consumers consume from the closest data center or the closest availability zone, right? Kind right, of stick yeah, there, sense. right? For cost purposes, right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But there's another reason to do it. And this reason really wasn't, and that's, by the way, if anyone cares, it's KIP 392. That is allow consumers to fetch from the closest replica. Um, one of the things that came up and has come up since is fetch for follower is also used to scale out. So one of the things in Kafka is Mm. your lowest, you know, unit of scale 
is a partition. So if I'm trying to, if I'm trying to like span out consumption, I can only have one instance of a consumer group consuming from a partition at a time. Yeah. If I use from fetch from follower, right, then mm. I can have, I can kind of span out my consumption. Not so much, and this is, this is actually, if you look at it, not so much, I mean, you can do it this way, but I think, you know, something like a, um, um, like a threaded consumer, like a parallel consumer is a better fit for when you actually need to do kind of consume and then process, like thread that kind of processing. Yeah. yeah. But let's say that you're running something and you're like, hey, right, I've got a ton of consumers that need to consume from this topic and I need some way to scale that out. And it's not enough to have like one consumer group. I need multiple consumer groups. If you don't have fetch from follower, you concentrate all that on a single node. So let's say I have 7,000 consumer groups yeah. and they all need to consume, right? Yeah, yeah. Another way to scale this out, because again, remember, we have those replicas that are just sitting out there on other nodes, is yeah. to do fetch from follower, right? When we do that primarily, a lot of times it's a performance issue, right? Because if not, you would just have one consumer group. So it can be a performance issue. And that is why I think this was found. Because basically, because we ignore any criteria you set, if you're doing fetch from follower, you're like in purgatory with that weight music. Do, 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 do. I'm looking at an imaginary watch. Do, 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 do. Right? That's like yeah. who you are. Except for you're absolutely going to get bounced out of purgatory when you hit fetch max weight milliseconds. That's still enforced. Right. Okay. So it's really like we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know about fetch max weight milliseconds. We'll bounce everybody out because that's the longest you can wait. So but any of those other criteria. Any criteria, mm -hmm. they'll just all be ignored and you sit there until yes. the next time. Oh, fun. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. I'm sorry, but like all I can picture is somebody setting that and then looking at a perf test and being like, what the heck? Yeah. Why is, and I think at the default fetch max weights is either 50 milliseconds or, or 500. I have to remember which one it is, but whatever it is, it's just going to be a line. That's your perf yeah. test, right? Like that's when they yeah, all yeah. come back. Wouldn't that be hilarious? I'm sort of surprised that didn't get picked up. Do you I mean, see, like, you see what I mean, and that's yeah. where I think the usage comes in. So if all I care about is fetching from the closest, I don't really. Maybe I'm not tuning on performance, right? Like maybe I don't really care. Yeah. I think that this came about because of that second use case where we're going. We really need multiple instances. We need to consume from multiple instances of a partition for speed. Yeah, and that's the kind of thing you end up perf testing, right? And that's yeah, the kind yeah. of thing you might end up tuning something, making it worth your while and setting a criteria, right? And then yeah. all of a sudden you're like, what the hey, son? I got a fire hose topic. I got plenty of throughput. I'm hitting my min fetch bytes. And there's some imaginary wall there. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Why are my my my, my consumer fetch requests like do oh. do do do, <laughs> yeah. you know? So that's so kind of and and props, huge props to Jeff Kim for finding this too. Um cool. Yeah. When, when was that fixed? Which version did that get fixed? Uh, 340. This is like my most recent Ooh, one. Yeah. That's, and 332. That's not even out it, yet, is it? It was backported to 332. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. 332. Cool. Crikey. Do you think um, if we do a Halloween podcast next year, do you think you're going to find any new interesting bugs? or? Are you, oh my gosh, yes. Now? I had to like, it was kind of really difficult this year to pick because I still have so many other ones. Oh, Yes. Okay. I do try to pick ones that are fixed, like unless they're really interesting and good. I do try to pick one because because that's always a nice ending. You know what I mean? Nobody wants like a cliffhanger like, yeah, this sucks. Bye. Right. Like, you know, that's not good. So I try to pick ones that have been fixed. Um, I always take uh, recommendations and suggestions. Um, OK, uh, I will add my I'm uh, Mastodon. I'm on Hackaderm because it's like the best pun ever. So I'm JB <laughs> Fletch on Hackaderm on Mastodon. If you want to ever hit me up with thing. Um, awesome. We'll put your link in the show notes. Yes. And so, uh, so yeah, but it, uh, I thank you very much for letting me come on again. Cause this is always, no, like... I've learned some, I've learned some interesting things. I've learned some scary things. Yes. And I'm sure our listeners have. Very cool. How long have you been learning about this? How did you get this much knowledge? Um, so I think, I think, and I always say this, so I, I work as a, I work as a, a, a customer success technical architect, right? Mm -hmm. 
And our job is, is pro, I know it's the longest title ever. It's proactive. Mm. It's like really proactive support. You have to, you, we like to stop people from running into problems. Um, so I play with use cases all the time. I get to go and look at, you know, things that real things that people are doing, which is why I kind of went here over end. And so in order to be able to talk about the entire, and I always say this, right? Like, and I, by the way, I am the Apache Kafka Jeopardy champion. I don't know if you knew that. Like current. I did not know that. I am the Apache Kafka Jeopardy champion too. And I think it's because in my job, I'm exposed to like a vi- like the whole horizontal aspects of the entire AK ecosystem, all the client libraries, all this kind of stuff. And yeah. to me, I have to, I want to understand things so I can explain it to my kids. And if I can't, then I don't understand them good enough. I have to be able to understand them. And I think when you do, you can reason about those. And you can give yeah. valuable insight into our roadmap and our direction and stuff like that. So I just really enjoy, I don't like surface level knowledge. So so I think it's more of a me thing where like I'll read Kips, I'll, I'll read, you know, um, Jira's, I'll go look at, you know, AK source code, like I'll figure out on the underlying framework for this kind of stuff. Replica fetchers is a great example. Um, those are highly misunderstood. And I did a talk about them. And that's kind of what I try to do too. I also try to do talks to kind of, demystify parts of AK that I feel aren't understood enough. Um, yeah, but, but again, I think, you know, please anybody feel free. Uh, if I've got something wrong to, you know, speak up and pipe up. Um, because again, yeah, like I'm sharing what I know at this point, yeah. some things I know very well, other things like, you know, I haven't deep dived into, to the extent where I could, you know, of other areas, but I, I'm, I, I think it's fun too. It's yeah, much more fun to be that. on a call and be able to to know kind of the actual deep internal. So if people ask you the what ifs, you can answer them. I just think that's part of our job is to kind of understand and be able to reply to just ask me anything about, you know, AK. Yeah, yeah. Especially when you're the Jeopardy champion. I know. I got to defend yeah. that. I mean, I don't know where You've I'm going to defend my title, title, but I need to. Well, okay, I mean, so I'm happy to. That leads me into my last question for you, because you might have to defend it at Kafka Summit London, which is coming up. Call yeah. the paper's now open. Do you have a topic in mind for Kafka Summit London? So I kind of do. Um, I might do one. I might do one on kind of um, pragmatic event streaming patterns um, mm-hmm. for legacy industries. And I'm not really sure how to say you have an on-prem DC other than to say legacy industries. (laughs) Or I could just say for companies that have an on-prem DC. Because I've been getting, you know, I think it's very unfortunate that you have people who have never worked in an actual place that has an on-prem DC or existing code base or existing infrastructure. You know, we're talking about companies and that that's kind of where I grew up. I worked at SAS Institute, right? Like we, and, and there's a, there, there are pragmatic patterns that are best in class, best practices and pretending like everybody's greenfield and that's what moves them forward is nonsense. Yeah. And so I, I'm about done with that. <laughs> <laughs> so I may present on that because I think, you know, and, and, and it's people ask me all the time, like, well, where are those patterns written down? And I'm like, in my head, which isn't helpful. So yeah. it's another way for me to document. So that's kind of what I'm thinking I might do now. And of course, I'll you know talk about Kafka streams as usual. Yeah, as always. <laughs> cool. Well, that's one to look forward to. Anna, it's been a pleasure. I wish we could have got you in in time for Halloween, but it's nice to do before this Christmas. This is fun though, because like, I'm, can I can I go show this? I'm just I just want to show it. Yeah, myself. absolutely. And I will describe it for the people who are just listening. Yeah, I mean, hold that up high. Oh, it's the it's the Apache Kafka Bauble K. Yeah, it's a yeah. K. People should know gonna... this. Don't put the stickers on the wrong way, like I did. <laughs> Are you going to stick that on your Christmas tree? Um, I don't. I think I might keep it in my office because it's like okay. a tiny Christmas tree, and it makes me happy. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. So and next see, year, next year, maybe at current, we'll give away little Christmas baubles. Based see, on that, that would be cool. That, that would, would be, be cool. really cool. And I can bring my glue gun. I have a glue gun. It's awesome. <laughs> Excellent. Everyone. Anna, until gun. then, thank you very much. No problem. Thank you so much. It's been fun. Cheers. Catch you again. Bye. The one, the only Anna McDonald there. Shall I tell you my favorite Anna McDonald fact? This is how dedicated she is in her fandom of Angela Lansbury. Anna owns a boat and she named her boat Murder She Floats, which I think is genius. If you want to get more from Anna's brilliant and unique mind, then head to developer.confluent.io, which is our free education site for all things Kafka. 
There you will find her complete course called Thinking in Events, which will help you to design better event-driven systems. It's there along with a raft of other useful free courses, so go and take a look when you get a chance. Meanwhile, if you have the knowledge you need, but not the Kafka, then take a look at our Kafka as a service service. Kafka as a service service. Then take a look at our Kafka as a service, Confluent Cloud. You can get a cluster up and running in minutes and let our engineers worry about maintaining it for you. And if you would like to get $100 of extra free credit to your account, then use the code PODCAST100 after you've signed up, and it will be added on behalf of us at Streaming Audio. And with that, it remains for me to thank Anna McDonald for joining us, and you for listening. I've been your host, Chris Jenkins, and I will catch you next time. Mm-hmm.